Uh, welcome to the sixth lecture of our series called Reforming Worship. We are um, in part five, specifically when, about, uh, we were, we're studying um, the attributes of God and there is a need for us to, to look at these attributes, for us to understand um, who we are worshiping. Right? We need to understand the object of our worship so that we would, so our desire to worship Him would grow even more. And I hope that uh, the, the series has been beneficial for everyone. And as we continue, we are ending the, uh, the list of the, we're at the last absolute attribute of God. And then we will shift to the relational attributes. And so, uh, at the end of the, uh, the last, rather, the last absolute attribute of God is none other than His love. And when we define love, I'd like to quote Samuel Waldron. Um, he says, love is that delight, affection, and unselfish impulse which desires and seeks the blessing and benefit of another and the actions to which such an impulse gives rise. So you see there, in Samuel Waldron's definition, there is that fervor, there is that intensity uh, when we speak of love. And we immediately apply that to uh, how human beings love, right? But whenever we speak of love, primarily we should look at it as an attribute of God. In fact, love can be a relational attribute. You remember, we distinguished what relational attributes are from um, the absolute attributes. We said that the absolute attributes are the qualities, characteristics, attributes that describes for us what God is, right? He's, uh, he's omniscient, immense, infinite, eternal, uh, and the, relation, the relational attributes, on the other hand, are the attributes of God in relation to His creatures, right? So in and of Himself, He's eternal. You don't need creation to understand that He is eternal. Even without creation, even without human beings, even without earth, solar system, universe, He is eternal. But in order for us to understand that He is gracious, He's merciful, we need to, you need creation, right? So yun yung mga relational attributes. And we're, 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 we're uh, in the next weeks, pag-aaralan po natin yun. And so, love, yes, it can be a relational attribute because it also talks about God's relationship with His creatures, Right? But primarily when we speak of the love of God, we're, we're talking about His attribute that characterizes God inherently, God Himself, or immanently in other terms. Okay? That He is love, He does not need creation for Him to love. Because He loves, walang, walang sinful dito sa term na to, ah. because He loves Himself. In human beings, you apply that, man, sinful yun. But when we speak of God loving Himself, we're talking about the Trinity loving one another. We're talking about the three persons loving one another. Father loving the second, the third person, the second person loving the first and the third, the third loving the first and the second. Meaning, so this means that, again, He does not need creation for Him to love. He is love. Okay? Love already exists even before He created the world. Before He created heaven, the heavens and the earth, there is love. Okay? In fact, there's no time when love did not exist. If we're saying that God is eternal and eternity is His absolute attribute, and we're also saying that love is an, an, an absolute attribute of God, therefore, there was no time when there was no love. Right? Samuel Waldron again says, love must be defined, first of all, not in terms of relationship between God and human beings, or creator and creatures, 
But it must first be understood in Trinitarian terms. It must be first understood that love exists um, within the Trinity. And so, again, and by the way, the scriptures does not talk about God being loving. Although in one sense we can say that, but the scripture says, He is love. Siya yung pinaka-definition ng love. In fact, pagmamahal siya. He is love himself. Uh, if you can go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us, Anyone who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. John is saying, if you don't know God, then you don't know love. If you don't know true love, then you don't know God because God is he, God is love. John was not saying God is loving. God is a loving God. No, he's saying God is love. If you want to know what true love is, you don't look anywhere else. You don't look at rom-coms. You don't look at the world, how, they, how the world defines what love is. You look at love himself. And that is God. Okay? Now let me be clear. Love is not God, but God is love. Okay? So God is love. And even in verse 16 of 1 John chapter 4, John says, So we have come to know and to believe the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Samuel Renihan says, God is not love. God is love. Loving is bred by occasion and cause. God is love himself. Right? We talked about this specific attribute, right? Not being affected by anything of himself. Do you remember what attribute that is? Meron ba nakakaalala? Right? Impassibility is God's attribute uh, that's, that tells us that God is not affected by anything outside of himself. Okay? So loving, according to Renihan, is bred by occasion and cause. Okay? There, sometimes human beings, we, we respond with love because of something that we too have received from others. So we become loving because maybe we also have received love from others. But God is not like that because God is love. He's not bred by any occasion. He's not moved by anyone. He's not moved from being unloving to now being loving. No, he is love himself. Okay? So God did not need us for him to be characterized with love, for he is love himself. According to John Frame, in his book, The Doctrine of God, he said, God's love is first of all directed toward himself. But even his self-love is self-giving. In divine self-love, each person of the Trinity embraces the others and glorifies the others. If you read the Gospels, you'll hear the words of Christ always glorifies the Father. And then he also says that the Father glorifies the Son. Right, you see, their love for one another. And we see that, again, in, in, in the Gospel, specifically the Father's infinite love for Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, he calls God the Son as his beloved. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Okay? And then in um, the same book, Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, it says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, and this speaks of Christ, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So the father speaks of his son as his beloved. If you go to John chapter 3, Verse 35, it says here, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Okay? So it's clear. Now, of course, that is reciprocated by the Son because 
in the same book, John chapter 14, it tells us that the Son too, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. That is uh, God the Son speaking. Okay? So the, son, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father. Now how about the Holy Spirit? Uh, of course, it is implied already in the fact that He is the third person and the fact that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit also is called the Spirit of God. And that speaks of God the Father. So it means, indeed, that the Holy, that the Trinity loves one another. Okay? So again, when we speak of love, we must primarily think of the Trinitarian love before God's love toward His creation. Now, now let's go to the love, His love toward creation. So again, while love is an absolute attribute of God, there is a sense that, is, that it is secondarily a relational attribute. Kaya nga maganda na ito yung hinuli natin sa absolute attributes kasi parang it bridges, nagiging gitna siya nung absolute at relational kasi it is also a relational attribute, right? It is a relational attribute as love is extended towards His creation. In fact, in, in the Bible, we can see clearly that there are three Three, there, there's a threefold distinction of the love of God toward His creation. According to Mark Jones, first, you can, we can see there His universal love toward all things. He has a universal love toward all things, toward all His creation. Living things, even yung mga uh, hindi actual human beings, meron siyang pagmamahal sa lahat ng kanyang creation. We can see that in Psalm 145, verse 9. It says here, The Lord is good to all, and His mercy is over all that He has made. His goodness is a loving goodness. Okay? Siya ay may kabaitan at yon ay characterized ng kanyang pagmamahal. The fact that He preserves creation, we can see His universal love toward all things. So we can see there prim- uh, first, the, that first distinction, yung universal love niya over all, uh, toward all things. Meron din naman, God's love specifically sa human beings. Okay? As you know, sa creation niya, ang apex of creation ay human beings. The fact that sa day 6, ang pinakahuli niyang kinreate ay human beings shows us that uh, mas may importance ang human beings even, even sa mga angelic beings. Right? Even sa angelic beings. The fact that God provided salvation for sinful human beings and not for the sinful angelic beings. May kita pa lang natin doon kung ano yung apex ng creation ng Panginoon. And so, He has love toward all human beings. And we see that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45. Christ says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He's saying he in fact preserves even the earthly lives of those who are evil. And he does so by making the sun rise Make, uh, making it rain for them. He has this um, love toward all human beings. And in other terms, ito yung tinatawag nating common. It's something that pe- all people are receiving, whether you are a believer or not, you are receiving such grace. And it is called common grace, right? We even an unbeliever is able to enjoy his or her food. He is able to wake up in the morning, uh, enjoy the sunrise, uh, good family relationship, 
has his or her own job. These things are common graces from the Lord. Common because everyone receives the same grace. Grace because it is still not deserved by all human beings. Right? Common grace. So, through common graces, through the common grace of God, we can see God's love toward all human beings. According to R.C. Sproul in his book, God's Love, he said, The gifts of God's common grace, which are blessings for the moment, actually, becomes, be, actually become occasions for judgment for the wicked. Now, see, while it is considered common grace, they are able to enjoy it for the moment, according to R.C. Sproul, it becomes occasions for judgment for them. Every time an impenitent person, impenitent and unrepentant person, receives this common grace, receives a gift from God with ingratitude, he or she heaps up wrath against the day of judgment. But God does not give these gifts to torment the sinner. They are truly beneficial. If they are able to eat and enjoy food, they're really, enjoy, they're really able to enjoy such blessings and gifts, common graces from the Lord. That's true. However, the fact that they are not thankful to the Lord, that heaps up wrath. In a, para, in a sense, para napupuno yung galit ng Diyos dahil hindi sila thankful sa lahat ng mga common graces ng Panginoon sa kanila. Na, Nagko-compound yung kanilang guilt that at the end of their life and in eternity, yung eternal heap, yung heap of wrath from God ay matatanggap nila. Okay? But God does not give these gifts to torment the sinner. They are truly beneficial. They become non-beneficial in the long run only because of the obstinate sin sinfulness of the wicked. But the misuse and abuse of the good gifts of God do not make them bad gifts. They are still good because they come from the Father who, uh, who is the source of good gifts according to James. They are still good in a sense that their graces undeserved and yet because they are not thankful to the Lord, they are heaping up the wrath of God. Now, there's a third one, and this is the special love of God. Some call this salvific love or saving love. The third one is the special love of God toward His people. Okay? We can see that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We have to understand that Peter is speaking of the church as God's own possession. And what that means is that he possesses the church in a way that he doesn't possess the others. Okay? In a loving way. So a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I know that many theologians, uh, especially our contemporaries, they use benevolence to speak of God's love for all. Parang may kanya-kanyang uh, definition ng mga distinctions ng love. Eh. However, the Puritans defined it differently. So they used these threefold distinction, universal, God's love toward all human beings, and the third one, God's special love. And within that special love, Doon nila pinapasok yung benevolence, where benevolence speaks of God loving special God's special love to the church even before He created the church. The Puritan speaks or spoke of the benevolent God's benevolence. They refer to God's foreknowing. Remember in Romans chapter eight. When Paul was telling us, when, when, when Paul was, was, was defining for us the chain of redemption, it starts with God foreknowing. And what we, know, what we understand by the word know, it means love. So it means God foreloved. Before his actual creation of the church, God already loved the church. 
And that is, according to the Puritans, that is the benevolence love of God. There's also the second one. So we're, we're, we're nasa, nasa loob tayo ng special love, ha? nandun yung pinag-uusapan natin. Yung second is God's beneficence. God's beneficence, it speaks of the actual work of Christ on the cross. Christ's actual redemption of the church in history. Okay? Yan yung beneficence ng Panginoon. And the third, the, the Puritan spoke of the third special love of God, and that is the, the love of delight or the love of friendship, wherein God delights to give rewards to the obedient people of God. And we can read that in Corinthians and in many more writings of Paul, where God does not even need to, to reward His people, and yet He would delight to reward His people. Right? In that sense, we can see that God's love of delight or God's love of friendship. Okay? And also, when we speak of God's special love, we are... So we are talking about the special favor of God whenever we are receiving things from God. Nabanggit ko kanina yung term na common grace. Common grace kasi a believer and an unbeliever, let's say magkatabi po sila sa hapagkainan. Pareho po sila nakakuha ng parehong pagkain. And we can say, yes, common grace ito ng Panginoon. Parehong undeserving sa pagkain. Common kasi God gives it to them whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, right? For an unbeliever, that is beneficial for you. The food is beneficial for you. The food is, a, is something good for you. You can really enjoy it, right? Uh, but yeah, you are not thankful for it and so you are heaping up the wrath of God until the day of judgment. However, for a believer who also receives the same food, it is received by the, God... The giver, it is being it is being given by the father to a child of God. You should look at it that way. When God provides to an unbelieving person, that is indeed common grace. But when God provides for someone whom Christ died for, it is God giving that person a good gift motivated by His love. So you see, magkatabi man ng believer at unbeliever sa hapagkainan, pareho sila ng kinakain, pareho sila na nareceive, yung isa motivated by, by love coming from God. <laughs> Naintindihan man natin yung difference nun. Right? In a sense, we can say it's common grace, but there is a special favor from God. We can see that in the prayer, in the Lord's prayer, right? When Christ said, when the apostles asked Christ, how then should we pray? Christ says, isa sa mga prayer ni Christ na, na binigay na sa apostles, do you remember? Give us daily bread. Why is there a need for a believer to ask that from God? Bakit kailangan patanungin yon ng isang believer? Kasi he, he can ask God and address God as Father. Call Him Father. And then ask, give us daily bread. And yet, an unbeliever will get daily bread. But an unbeliever will never ask and never address the Father. And yet, a believer is given that opportunity to address God as the Father. And a believer is given that wonderful grace from the Lord to receive daily bread from the Father with love. You see the difference, right? So, if God then, in His essence, is love, then we can be certain that His love for us is unending and it is perfect. It is incomparable to, to the love of the most loving person in your family, in the church. It is incomparable to, to such love because there is no perfect love coming from sinners it will always be hindered by sinful motivation. It can always be hindered by sinful thoughts. And yet, God's perfect love is a holy love. 
Right? Hindi yun hindered ng sin kasi hindi makasalanan ng Diyos. Not only that, our love is vanity. Our love is but a mere breath. It will end. But God's love doesn't. Why? Because He is eternal. If God is eternal, then His love is eternal. And we can rest doon, mga kapatid. That would mean we are worshiping God who is love. That would mean that whenever we receive good gifts from the Lord, it comes from the perfect, holy love of God. Nakareceive na ba kayo ng mga regalo from people? Uh, I'm, uh, for sure, people would give you, give you gifts and then motivated sila ng pagmamahal. Pero may temptation din sa mga giver na magkaroon ng kahit 1% of sinful thought. Pero ang Panginoon, wala ni isang ganoong sin. Hindi siya hindered by anything. Hindi siya hindered by any sinful deed, motivation, or thought. Okay? And because God is eternal, His love is eternal, it is timeless, meaning it already existed even before we were created, and it continues to, ex- to exist even now in history. Because God is infinite, His love has no limits. Remember the attribute of infinity? Because yung infinity ng Diyos, it means that He is not bound by anything. Okay? And because God is self-existent, He's not dependent upon other people, hindi rin nakadepende sa actions natin yung love ni God. Now, hindi, pa mag- hindi pa magandang balita yun, mga kapatid? The fact that God is assay or self-existent, aseity, in- independent, it means that it did not depend on us. It does not depend on us. God's love does not depend on us because if it does, depend on us, Christ will not be, Christ will not die on the cross. Remember, unconditional ang pagmamahal ng Diyos. Because God is impassible, His love for us is perfect and cannot be affected by anything coming from us. According to James Dolezal, His perfect fullness of love is not intensified by our acts of obedience. Now, Okay, nag-obey tayo sa Panginoon, right? Nag-obey tayo sa mga precepts ng Panginoon. Some, sometimes we feel, oh, we feel loved by the Lord and that is good. Pero it's not like mas nag, naging loving ang Panginoon sa atin because of what we have done. No, hindi na babago yung intensity ng love ng Panginoon sa atin. His intrinsic, infinite hatred for sin, on the other hand, is not made a little hotter by our transgressions. Now, if we are recipients of the love of God, when we do, when, when, we, when we commit sins, hindi rin na overpower ng wrath ni God toward sin yung love niya sa atin. Hindi. The fact that He loves us, wala siyang wrath toward His own people. Hindi ba good news yun? I mean, evaluate natin mga pinaggagawa natin. Uh, buong linggo, buong buwan. Hindi lang yung pinaggagawa yung mga tumatakbo sa isipan natin na alam nating makasalanan. And yet, dahil mahal tayo ng Diyos, walang, walang ounce of wrath na ibubuhos siya sa atin. Kasi lahat nung galit niya sa kasalanan, He already poured on Jesus Christ on the cross. Yun na yung fullness ng wrath niya. That's why what we are receiving is but His love and never His wrath. Tandaan niyo po yan, mga kapatid. Never His wrath. We will never, if you are in Christ, you will never ever be a recipient of the wrath of God. And yes, we may be sick. We, we, pwedeng tayo magkasakit. Pwedeng makaranas tayo ng sakuna sa buhay. Yung pinakamalala pa. And yet, that is not coming from a wrathful God. It is, but a by. It is but a, uh, but a result of this cursed world. Yes. But it's not God hating His people. He poured His hatred on us already. 
And so the great manifestation of the love of God is the sending of the Son to redeem us on the cross. For us to understand God's love, God sent Jesus Christ, and He is love personified, the love of God became man. He showed it by His obedience to the law. Take note, the, the scripture says, love fulfills the law of God. Christ did it. He, he lived perfectly. He fulfilled the law of God. And that is love. Not only that, in his death on the cross, sacrificial love, right? So we can see the greatest manifestation of the love of God. He showed it to us in Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 to 10, it says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. So that we too might live holy lives through the holy life, through the sacrificial death, through the substitutionary uh, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So those who are in Jesus Christ have been loved by God also not, we can see primarily it on the cross, God's love for us, but also because, we, because of the death of Christ, our eyes have been opened, and now we understand na yung pagmamahal, pagmamahal pala ng Panginoon, eh, before pa niya ginawa ang mundo. Right? And we can see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 onwards. Dadaanan natin yung uh, text na yan later on. But Romans chapter 8, 28 says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Later on, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that as we look at the sovereignty of God. But there you can see, well, we are recipients of the good providence of God. Those who love God, right? Not only that, when we speak of the intensity Yung fervor nun. Kung gano ka deep, gano kalawak yung love ng Panginoon sa atin, uh, the scriptures gave us yung ano yung measurement ng love na yun. Okay? Nasa John chapter 17, verse 22 to 23, it says here, The glory that you have given me, this is Jesus Christ praying to God. The Father, the glory that you've given me, I have given to them that they may be one. He's speaking of the church, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, He's saying Christ in the church and in the church in Christ, that they may be become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and so that the world may know that you love the church even as you love me. <coughs> Excuse me. That was the son speaking to the father and saying, malaman, sa, malaman nila na wa. The church would know that you love the church just as you love me. And when we speak of the love of God, pinakita natin kanina, the father eternally loves the son. The son reciprocates that in his eternal love to the father and then we're, saying, we're seeing in scriptures that Jesus Christ is saying how the Father loves the Son, that same, that intensity, that fervor, same din yung intensity ng pagmamahal ng Diyos sa kanyang bayan, sa church. Right? So, we have to understand, it's, it's not a lesser love. Right? He's saying, as you have loved me. Same intensity. God loves His people. The Father loves His Son just as... The Father loves the people of God just as He loves the Son. According to Richard Phillips, Christians themselves have been caught up into the love of the Father for the Son, secure and content and fulfilled because loved by the Almighty Himself. With the very same love he reserves for his son. 
We are loved by the Father in just the same way as and with just the same intensity and fervor with which the Father loves the Son. May kabigatan yun, mga kapatid. Right? Ganun na lang ang pagmamahal sa atin ng Panginoon. And you have, you have to understand na, na hindi natatapos yung love ng, uh, Diyos, ng, ng Diyos Ama sa, sa Diyos Anak. E kung ganun, then ganun din yung pagmamahal sa atin ng Panginoon. <clears throat> And because of Christ, dahil nga eternal ito, hindi nasa-separate ng kamatayan natin ang pagmamahal ng Diyos. Mamatay man tayo mamaya. Or in the next days, months, years, hindi mapuputol, makakut off ang love ng Diyos sa atin. In fact, we will have an immediate incre- uh, understanding, merong increase of the knowledge of love, of that love, when we die. We will, pagdating ni Kristo, we'll be able to see His face. Yung sinatawag natin, beatific vision, we shall see the face of God. That is an increase of knowledge, increase of love. Love will perpetuate in heaven. In fact, sabi nga ni Paul sa 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, <clears throat> sabi ni Pablo, <clears throat> So now, faith, hope, and love abide. While we are living here on earth, there is faith because we, we are li- we're living, having faith with God. We, we can't see Him. We can't see Christ, right? Hindi pa tayo living by sight, living by faith tayo ngayon. So may faith, meron ding hope. We're living, hoping that Christ will come, hoping Uh, for all the good things that comes to us uh, by the accomplishment of Christ's work, we also know that there's love here on earth. We experience the love of God. And yet, when we get to heaven, the fact that Paul says here, the greatest of the three is love, he's saying, yung faith at hope, hindi na natin siya kailangan sa heaven. Kasi we're gonna live by sight. Wala na ring hope kasi we're together with the hope, together with Christ. And yet love alone will abide. It will perpetuate. It is the greatest of the three, Paul says. So how does this connect to worship, which is the, the very essence of this series. God shows His love for us as He sanctifies us and cleanses us In the words of Paul, by the washing of water in the world. And we usually quote Ephesians chapter 5, and we immediately think of the role of the husbands, right? Let us not forget that Ephesians 5.26 primarily speaks of Christ's love. The greater husband for the greater bride, the greater Eve, which is who is the church. Christ shows his love to the church, By washing the church. By cleansing the church. How does he cleanse the church? By the water. By wash, the washing of water in the word of God. When does that happen? It happens on his day. It happens on the day that God has instituted for us to come together and receive cleansing, receive the washing. Receive the preaching of the word. That is how Christ shows his love for us. I mean, primarily you look at the cross, right? But continuously you see his love for us. Whenever he feeds to us his word, whenever he feeds to us himself. So that's how it connects to worship. Okay? And Christ's love, according to Paul, if you go to Ephesians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4, you don't need to go there, maybe na lang mamaya, but Ephesians 4, from, from Ephesians 4 to Ephesians 6, it talks about the do's. It talks about what we should do as Christians. Ephesians chapter 1 to 3 talks about what God in Christ has done for us. And then 4 to 6 talks about our duties. Bago siya mag-shift doon sa duties ng Kristiyano, at the end of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 
Nag-pray si Paul. Ang sabi ni Pablo, I pray that the Spirit of God will give you, will, 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 that Christ will dwell in your heart so that you may know the breadth, the width, the height. Parang ma- makita nyo yung, yung, yung lawak, yung lali, kalaliman ng pagmamahal ng Panginoon. Sinasabi na yun. So, ibig sabihin, yun ang prayer ni Paul. And then right after that prayer, sa kanya sinabi yung mga kailangan nilang gawin. What does that mean? Ibig sabihin, talaga makikita natin sa church ang love ng Panginoon. Right? He presents to us His love through the preaching of the Word. Now you can do your duties. And take note of Ephesians chapter 4. The beginning of Ephesians chapter 4 talks about God's call to the church to be united, to remain with one another, to build up one another. Right? Because they have been equipped by the love of Christ through the preaching of the word, now they can serve one another. That's Ephesians chapter 4. And then Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, saan to nag-extend? Sa Christian household na. Right? Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the unity of the church upon receiving the bread, the width, the length, the height of the love of Christ. You apply that to the church in unity. You build up one another. Maging united kayo together. And then Ephesians 5 and 6, that now extends to the household. Husbands, Oh, sorry, wives muna. Wives, submit to your husbands. And then husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. Discipline them in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not only that, it then extends to the workplace. Right? Masters. And then uh, servants or bond servants, submit to your masters. Eh lahat ng to, ang context nito, tayo na-receive natin yung pagmamahal ng just through the preaching of the word. Ready na tayo. As we have received the love of God in preaching, in worship, ready na tayo bumaba ng Zion, i-apply natin ang pagmamahal sa bawat isa, sa ating mga tahanan, at sa ating mga trabaho. Yun ang pagmamahal ng Panginoon, how He dispenses such love to His people. And so that is, these, th- those rather, were the uh, absolute a- uh, attributes of God. Eleven. Now we go to the relational attribute. Ito na, yung, what, y- his attributes in relation to his creatures, in relation to his creation or human beings. Okay? First, sovereignty. Sovereignty. This is the attribute that is seen in how he maintains his creation. The fact that the earth is still, uh, kung baga, na, kaya pa natin mabuhay dito sa mundong ito, uh, nag-grow pa rin ang culture, uh, at patuloy pa rin pamumuhay dito sa mundong ito, that's because of the sovereignty of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 tells us, now this speaks of salvation, but even salvation, most, most importantly, Paul says that this is according to the purpose of Him who works all things. Yeah. You, in the writings of Paul, you will read uh, this phrase many times. Who works all things. It shows His sovereignty. Who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Now, sovereignty is His attribute, what He is. And when He applies His attribute of sovereignty, yun na yung tinatawag nating providencia. That's what we call providence. When, when, we, when he applies this attribute to his creation, how he works all things together according to his purpose, that is what you call providence. But it comes from what he is. And what he is, is that he is sovereign. He is a sovereign God. Sabi ni John Owen, ineffable act. Hindi maintindihang act. Hindi kayang... Uh, unspeakable, an ineffable act or work of Almighty God whereby He cherishes. This is, sovereignty is His act that, that he, whereby He cherishes, He sustains, and governs the world or things by Him created, moving them agreeably to those nature which He blessed them, endowed them with all in the beginning unto those ends which He has proposed. We do not believe in a deist kind of God. We mentioned before that deist or deism is the belief that God created the world and then He left His creation on uh, itself. 
Hinayaan niya, mabuhay yung creation ng hindi siya actively gumagalaw. No? Aktibo po ang Diyos. He's active. Hindi po natutulog ang Diyos. He has been active. The three persons of the Trinity are all active. They're, they're all active in salvation. So it's false to think na ang salvation, ang active lamang ay ang Holy Spirit. No, active po ang God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is also wrong to think na, oh, died already, died. Uh, Christ died on the cross already, and He also said, it is finished. So tapos na po ang ministry niya. In a sense, yes, it is finished because He has died. At nangyari na yung pinaka-work niya, and that is His death. That's what He meant. But He continues to minister. Aktibo po siya. Remember, he, according to Hebrews, he prays to the Father. Right? He intercedes continuously for us. And of course, the Holy Spirit is active. Right? According to Mark Jones, the eternal God ordains all things from eternity. Pinlano na ng Diyos ang lahat ng bagay from eternity and brings them to their intended goal in history, to the praise of His name. Meaning, alam niyo, minsan, kunari, if you have a position, kunari, sa isang uh, corp, sa corporate, kunari, boss ka, and you, you, you plan things for your people, and then usually, hindi na ikaw yung gumagawa nun. Kasi hinahayaan mo na yung mga staff na o oh, sila yung gumawa nun. E eh, yun yung trabaho talaga ng boss at yung mga staff niya. Pero ang Diyos, siya na yung nagplano, pero siya pa yung aktibo who works all things together for His purpose. Okay? And so the providence of God, we see that it preserves creation, the fact that creation is preserved. Now you can say, yes, creation is preserved because He made a covenant with Noah for all creatures that He will preserve the earth. Yes, that's true. And it is also true that He does the preserving through His providence. Okay? And not only that, He governs all things. Ibig sabihin, may nakaupo, may haring nakaupo who governs all things. So kahit sinong earthly ruler ang kakatakutan natin, even yung earthly ruler na yon, may it be very bad or good, siya ay under pa rin ng authority ng Diyos, who governs all things. Ibig sabihin, pasok pa rin yun sa purpose ng tunay na governor of all things, who is God. And because God is sovereign, we can definitely rest in His beneficial providence. Right? And this is something that we, I mean, we worry about these things. We worry about what we're, what, what's going to happen in our lives. We're, we're, we worry. We are worriers, right? And we forget that God is sovereign. Remember what Spurgeon said? Na yun yung pinaka-comfort niya. That's, that the sovereignty of God is like a pillow that he can rest on. Pag Lord's Day after ng worship, mag-fellowship pa kayo, pagod na kayo nun eh. Pero may lakas pa kayo mag-fellowship. Pero pag uwi nyo, di ba sarap nung hihiga ka sa, ay, tas alambot ng unan, tas parang may comfort, Ganun yung, ganun yung sinasabi ni Spurgeon na kind of comfort. Not thinking of problems, problems not hindering his mind because he is thinking of God who is sovereign and who has control over all things. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, I'm sure you, you, you know this, right? These are words coming from someone who has been trained by it, who has seen the providence of God in his life. He was thrown by his brothers to the pit. He has, he then became a, the second in command in Egypt. Nakita niya kung paano gumalaw ang Panginoon. That's why in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, he was confident to say that everything happened because of the sovereignty of God. He says, 
to his brothers, Joseph, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. See his confidence, right? May confidence ba tayo? Meron ba tayo? Do we rest in the providence of God, in the sovereignty of God, to say that whatever evil that happens to us, we can say that God brings out the good. That God, in His perfect wisdom, can in fact use evil and bring out the good. Clarification. The evil does not come from the heart of God. It comes from evil men. It comes from Satan. And yet God uses it to still bring out the good. Ganun yung control ng Panginoon. Right? And primarily, saan mo yun makita? Nakita natin sa scripture, nakita natin sa buhay ni Joseph yan, yung mga nangyari kay Joseph, lumabas yung goodness doon. Right? Because God, because Joseph went through it, naligtas yung mga kapatid niya. Meron pa, if you've read Esther, the book of Esther, si Haman wanted to kill Mordecai, nagpatayo siya ng malaking uh, kung, uh, malaking uh, parang kung saan isas, isasampay na doon, papako, si, si Mordecai, isasabit sa kamatayan. And then, ang nangyayari, si Mordecai din yung namatay doon. So parang pinagawa niya yung sarili niyang ano, uh, kung saan siya mamamatay. So ikita mo, despite the evil, lumabas yung goodness doon. But primarily, we can see the work of God in Jesus Christ. Right? Kita natin, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He was indeed murdered. According to Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching to the Jews, he's saying that the one you killed... Right? They killed Christ. They, of, they were, of course, uh, it was the plan of Satan for Christ to be killed, and yet, the very death of Christ is the death of Satan. Okay? And that is the ultimate plan of God. And those who believe in Jesus Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, everything that happens to us, whether it's bad or good, all things work together for good. If it is bad, it is indeed for our sanctification. If it is death, it is for your glorification. <laughs> Sabi sa synopsis for a pure theology, pre-existent structural ordaining in God's mind of things toward a goal, that is, the practical knowledge of God whereby He preordained each and every single thing from eternity and directs them to their proper goal for His own glory. This is what we're saying. The reason why there is goodness out of such evil because He has directed all things toward a certain goal. It is Christ-tilted. Lahat ng nangyayari sa mundo, it is for the purpose of Christ, for the purpose of the work of Jesus Christ. It's happening to you now, whatever, however bad it is, it is because of the sanctification that comes from Christ. You are being conformed to His likeness. Lahat ng nangyayari sa mundo, nakatilt toward Christ's glory. And so how do we connect that to worship the sovereignty of God is our weekly reminder as the gospel is preached to us and we see in the gospel the picture of God's total control of all things. That He allowed sin for us to see the cross, for us to see redemption, for us to see His mercy, His grace, and His love. Next week, we will continue the relational attributes. Um, it's already 2.29, pero pag mayroon pong questions, let me know. That ends our lecture. Any questions, Pop? Questions?
All right. Okay. Let's pray. Our most high God and heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your love for us and for um, uh, your providence. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we have been reminded of these things. And uh, both attributes can be seen on the cross of Christ. We can see your love for us, and we can see your, um, your providence uh, on the cross, O oh Lord, that uh, despite the evil of this world, you uh, are so controlled that you have um, sent your Son uh, to die on the cross for our redemption. So thank you, O oh Lord. Um, we lift up to you our worship this uh, 3 p.m. I pray, Lord, that uh, your word would truly speak, speak to us that it would uh, benefit us and would all, would all the more uh, conform us to the holiness of Christ. Uh, may you alone be glorified uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.